You're watching FJTN, the Federal Judicial Television Network. Live from the Federal Judicial Center in Washington, D.C. Leading in times of crisis. Welcome to today's program. The tragic events of September 11, 2001 frame the background for this program. Just as the structures of important American buildings collapsed on that dark day, so did many of the assumptions Americans made about their lives. Like all other Americans, court managers and leaders throughout the country were deeply affected by these events and currently feel a new sense of urgency and commitment to their roles as leaders. The bankruptcy court for the Southern District of New York, which is six blocks from the site of the World Trade Center, was directly caught up in the chaos and calamity that resulted from the attacks on the towers. Today we'll hear directly from the clerk and chief deputy of that court about their experiences in coping with this disaster. But this was not the first time that federal court managers have had to lead their courts through emergency situations. Many other crises have beset the courts, including floods, hurricanes, earthquakes, and murderous rampages. We'll also hear from court leaders who have dealt with some of these challenges. The good news is that human beings have the capacity to learn and grow from adversity. Through prior experience with a variety of catastrophes, court managers and leaders have learned a great deal about leading in times of crisis, as our guests today make clear. And from their experiences, we can all learn. This program is intended to guide court managers and leaders through the steps involved in preparing for and handling crisis situations. The truth is that courts and their staffs must always be ready to confront crises of one kind or another. Such unfortunate events are a part of life that will never completely disappear. In this program, we will also highlight important principles of effective leadership during difficult times. I should mention that on April 18th, we will present a second program on this subject. The program today focuses on court managers. In April, we'll deal with how staff can prepare themselves for and overcome crises. Here's how we'll proceed today. First, I'll briefly review our objectives. Then we'll show some video clips of Kathleen Farrell, clerk of the bankruptcy court in the Southern District of New York, and her chief deputy, Vito Jenna who spoke about their experience in the aftermath of September 11th to participants at the FJC's National Bankruptcy Conference for Clerks and Chief Deputies last November. Via videotape, we'll also hear from Sherry Carter, District Court Executive and Clerk of the District Court for the Central District of California and Los Angeles. She and one of her Chief Deputies, Alan Lesline, will tell us what they faced in dealing with a major flood in the courthouse in September 2000 and how they use their experience to become better prepared for future emergencies. Following these video presentations, we'll discuss some critical responsibilities of leaders in times of crisis with a panel of court managers and leaders who have dealt successfully with 9-11 and other disasters. We'll also hear from a representative of the administrative office of the courts about the resources the AO offers to courts in emergencies and the model plan for continuity of operations that it is developing. Let me take a moment to review a few protocols we'll use today. First, should you have any difficulty viewing the program, call Convergent Media at 1-888-236-9044. And all sites, please feel free to fax in questions at any time during the broadcast. We'll get to as many as we can during the question and answer sessions. We've set aside some time for both facts and push-to-talk questions, so get those ready, too. If you are a push-to-talk site, when you do step up to the mic, please remember to ID yourself and your site. Now let's take a look at the objectives for today's program. When it concludes, we hope our audience will be able to des describe the actions of colleagues who successfully led their courts through a crisis. Identify strategies to prepare for and respond to emergencies. 
Describe critical leadership responsibilities in times of crisis. Identify resources to meet the challenge of a crisis. Okay, it's time to hear from the people who have dealt with these crises. Kathleen Farrell eloquently describes the varied emotions that she experienced as the towers fell and her building literally shook. Managers are human, just like everyone else, and they react with shock, disbelief, uncertainty, and fear. But at the same time, they have to carry out their responsibilities. It was a beautiful summer-like day. Everybody came into work as ready to start a, a normal day, and everybody was ready to go over on September 11th to a, uh, a festivity at the World Trade Center Plaza, where all of the restaurants in Lower Manhattan were going to be uh, selling their specialty dishes for reasonable prices, and everybody was going to go over there for lunch. So we were all just ready to start a really good day. Shortly thereafter, this is what was coming towards our building. This big cloud, after the uh, towers collapsed, we didn't know what was in this cloud, it was coming towards us. All these people were running towards our building. We had to make a decision, what are we going to do? Are we going to send people out into this? Are we going to keep people in the building? What are we going to do? It looked like a volcano erupted and we were just sitting right under it. We got together, we decided that the best place for the employees and all the visitors to the court would be to move everybody to the basement, which has been converted into an auditorium. So we had water, we had bathrooms, and we felt rather safe down there. And actually the CSOs were pulling people in from the street and bringing them down to the basement. We were all in a position that we just didn't know what we were doing. I'm sure all of these thoughts were going through your minds, too, as to what to do if, some, if an emergency does strike your area. After the initial shock of the Trade Center attacks, Farrell and her chief deputy, Vito Jenna, had to take immediate action while at the same time implementing a longer range crisis management strategy. First, she describes the steps she took to ensure that the courthouse was safe and the court could resume operations as soon as possible. Then Jenna talks about some of the things to consider in preparing for future emergencies. When we were evacuated from our building on September 11th, we were not permitted back in the building until the Monday afterwards. But before I brought anyone back, I, I, was, I, I made sure that I had numbers to call uh, we happen to be in a GSA building. It would be a little different if you were in a leased building. Make sure you get in touch with the landlord. Um, I made sure that I got in touch with them. I made sure that the concerns that I knew the employees would have, and I had also, were that the uh, ventilation system was shut down immediately and we saw this cloud of dust coming to us, that the ductwork had been cleaned out, the air filters had been changed, that the uh, that maintenance had gone through there and cleared away all of the dust and debris, that a structural engineer came and took a look at our building to make sure that it was safe and sound. It appeared to be, but we wanted to make sure. I didn't make it home until Wednesday afternoon at 3 o'clock, and by Thursday morning at 10.30, we were back up in business. Thank you. Thanks to the replication server that we had down in Washington, and we were able to redirect our electronic case filing to that replication server. I did a, uh, a message from home that they put it as a replacement to our homepage and uh, gave the story. It hyperlinked to the website. It gave people instructions on what to do. We had uh, opened up our two divisional offices by then. We had sent some of the staff from Manhattan to White Plains, some of the White Plains staff up to Poughkeepsie. So we were up and, up and running and doing business. As Kathleen mentioned, the need for hot sites is very important. Hot site would be any site that you could more or less utilize or put a system in and continue your operation. In our case, it was Washington. The other thing you should consider, too, is redundancies. Put them wherever possible and if it's cost effective. Look at your neighboring courts, too, see what they could help you with. And the third thing is alternative to technology, things that if you don't have a system, for how long can you continue manually? Could this be possible? And it is. The last thing is alternative to communication links. As we mentioned, our phone system was working, but it may not always be uh, there for us when we need it. Farrell emphasized that her court occupies a multi-tenant building with other federal agencies and a Smithsonian Museum. 
The events of September 11th made it clear that agreement among all tenants in the building on a common security plan and good communication among them is imperative in emergency situations. On that day, as Farrell and other agency heads were directing staff and visitors to the basement, the museum was sending people out into the street. At security meetings later on, it was really a very, very hot topic. So uh, the, what I, I'm, I'm suggesting for the building emergency plan is that you make sure that you are in constant contact with the other agencies in the building Everybody is on the same page. Everybody agrees who's going to be in charge in case of a disaster. In our, in our case, our um, emergency building plan had the chief judge it took over in case of an emergency. He would be making the final, the final decisions. Uh, in his absence, it would be me. And just my luck, he was out in California. <laughs> so everyone was looking, for, looking to me. Farrell discussed a couple of steps the court took after September 11th to give staff and judges quick information in an emergency. First, they made up a list of immediate tasks in case of emergency evacuation that has directions for everyone and then breaks it down into what each department can do. The caveat here is that you only take time to do these things if you are not in immediate danger. The list is laminated and posted throughout the court for quick reference. Second, the court made up cards, one for judges and one for staff. The cards have important phone numbers on them. For the judges, there's an 800 number for the U.S. Marshals and a number for the local U.S. Marshals, as well as feral cell and home phone numbers. The staff card doesn't have Farrell's number, but does have the emergency information line. In putting together or updating a plan and preparing for any future emergency situations, Farrell and Jenna had a number of suggestions which we'll briefly note. Build systems with continuity and recovery in mind. Identify alternate sites for critical functions and replicate data to a backup site. Envision different emergency situations and their consequences. Develop approaches to minimize risk and test each approach. Ensure that an evacuation procedure is in place. Identify a location for staff to assemble and an alternate site, and ensure that judges know where to assemble. Maintain one version of the emergency plan and secure sign-off by all tenants. Ensure that emergency plans are current and assign one person to update the plan. And finally, take drills seriously. We'll look now at a more common type of emergency that our courts have faced, a flood. We talked to Sherry Carter, clerk of the district court in Los Angeles, and one of her chief deputies, Alan Lesline, about the emergency situation they confronted on September 30, 2000. Although the circumstances were significantly different from 9-11, some similar themes emerge. First, Carter and Lesline give us a vivid picture of what happened and how they responded. On Friday, September 29th, a six-inch water main broke into the courthouse and it was discovered early in the morning on Saturday, September 30th. At that point, it had flooded the basement and the Spring Street level of the courthouse. I was contacted by my chief deputy clerk. I was an hour away, drove into the courthouse because I could not believe that it was as bad as what I was hearing. So I drove down to the courthouse to see whether or not it was really that bad and it was terrible. It basically flooded almost the entire Main Street level, but primarily the clerk's office, the docketing, courtroom deputy area, the records area. In fact, we had to ship almost 13,000 files out to be freeze-dried because the water came up almost four inches or more in certain areas of the file room, and so the lower level of the files had to be shipped out, but the moisture from the water actually affected the files above that lower level and they had to be shipped out as well. The exhibits area in the basement was completely destroyed. It came through uh, air registers, it came through uh, troughs that, that housed our, um, our wires and our data cabling, and our main transformer vault was actually about six feet underwater. This of course caused the electricity to short out in the entire building and in fact and I think in a four block area of the immediate Civic Center area here in Los Angeles. Sherry was here just you know maybe 15 minutes after I got here 
and uh, she came in. Uh, we got flashlights. Those who were prepared had rubber boots. The rest of us did not. Uh, we waded through the, uh, the different areas with flashlights trying to uh, assess what the damage was to our own personal property. Um, and it was pretty hard to do because we were in total darkness in most of the areas, but we knew it, it was substantial. I looked at, first of all, are we going to have court on Monday? And if not, how am I going to get notice and handle that and get staff to stay home so that they won't be in the way of the cleanup? How will I quickly get the records out of here? Cleaning up the damage, the ceiling tiles and the wet carpeting and the systems furniture, getting the computers back online. I was concerned that even if the computers appeared to be working, if you flip the switch on, you know, you could create a whole new electrical hazard. There were three main phases to the cleanup. First was the water extraction, and that occurred over probably the next 48 hours. Uh, they brought in huge vacuum cleaners, so to speak, and sucked up every bit of loose water that they could. And then they started bringing in uh, equipment to reduce the humidity in the building. And there was an urgency to this because the longer the humidity remained in the building, the more likely we were to grow mold. So they um, brought in auxiliary power plants and placed them out on Main Street, opened up windows and brought in huge temporary ducts throughout the entire clerk's office and on the lower floor, blowing in extremely hot and dry air. In the paper document phase, um, that was actually the third phase. We had a disaster recovery team in here who was responsible for taking all of the records that had gotten wet. They brought a trailer into our, our parking lot and they freeze dried them and then flew them to Fort Worth where they have a facility set up for basically extracting that moisture out of them. Carter said the court had an emergency plan in place, so she initially thought she was prepared to deal with the situation. But she quickly realized that the plan was inadequate, that it didn't deal with issues such as what to do if the court couldn't operate on Monday, and a lot of the information wasn't current. Phone numbers had changed, area code numbers had changed, I didn't have good cell phone numbers. So when I got down here and I was trying to get things moving, I was very frustrated because I couldn't reach the people I needed to reach. At the time we developed the plan, we had every intention to update it, but we didn't have an emergency, and I think when people moved or when area codes changed, no one really realized there was a need to keep that updated. Uh, after that, I actually established an emergency disaster team. Uh, Mr. Lesline was part of that. We had several other employees who worked on that team, and we developed a really good plan. I actually felt very fortunate that we learned from something as insignificant as a flood, but if it was a strong earthquake, for example, we were really not prepared. Carter and the emergency disaster team she put together immediately went to work to revise and update the court's plans and procedures. I didn't have any mechanism to call employees to tell them not to come in if they were unaware of an emergency. So the first thing we did is we established a calling tree where I will call five or six people, they will call five or six people, and so on and so on. And we've tested the calling tree, we make sure numbers are working, and so that was the first thing we did. The second thing we did is I wanted to find a way where I could notify judges by building um, a separate calling tree. We found a system that allows us to send a recorded message to up to four lines to the judges, their home phone, their cell phone, their personal line, and their secretary's line, so that if I need to let them be aware of an emergency, I can do that very, very quickly. And we have it by building, and then we have them grouped all together. The third thing we did is this emergency disaster team that I put together after the flood developed this disaster recovery manual. And as part of the manual, we have not only the calling tree and all the numbers, but it also identifies by department any special issues that are relative to the department's physical space that a cleanup team would need to know about, such as hazardous or flammable materials, whether they have any special security requirements like special vaults, what they would need to do to provide essential services if their department was completely shut down, a variety of questions. So not only does it address our calling tree needs, but it also addresses our disaster recovery so that if the court, the entire Spring Street building was out of operation, what by department would we need to do to keep operating? Carter took another step as a result of her experience with the flood. As the only person in the clerk's office with a top secret clearance, 
She had to sit in the secure FBI vault for eight hours while it was cleaned. She now has two other staff with top secret clearance. But she said the most important thing she learned is that courts should develop a strong, workable notification system. We asked her if she felt better prepared because of the actions she had taken after the flood to deal with a disaster of World Trade Center proportions and whether any changes were made to the court's plans and procedures following September 11. I'm not sure anybody would ever be prepared for something that large, but if we had a, a big emergency, we now have the calling trees in place, we have notification systems in place, we have a manual we can go to that's updated, we have practices, um, and we know what our roles are going to be. We know each department has analyzed what things they need to take with them to another location to keep operating should that particular courthouse be out of service. So I think we're very prepared now if any one of our courthouses was shut down for a reason. The emergency of 9-11 really made us look much more closely at what would happen during working hours. So we dusted off, we've dusted off our occupant emergency plans. We're in the process of uh, updating to make sure that all of our floor wardens are accurate and up to date. We're, we're having more frequent training meetings so people understand exactly what their roles and responsibilities are and who each other are, you know, who the other floor wardens are within the building. Uh, we've also undertaken a, a tremendous amount of other measures, you know, from looking at where the air intake to the building is and closing certain ones that were at street level, you know, developing screening facilities for mail that are outside of the building. Um, you know, we've looked at, uh, the marshals looked at emergency places for the court to operate. I would say that we've done a lot more practice drills where we've had the Court security officers walk people through their exit routes so that in a real emergency or even a practice fire drill where they're not walking you through, they do know their route out. And we've practiced our calling trees, our notification system several times and probably will do so every quarter. Now that we've heard in some detail about the experiences in New York and Los Angeles, I'm going to ask my colleague Michael Siegel to take over and introduce our panel. Thanks, Marilyn. It's a pleasure to have three outstanding court leaders with us today. Like Kathleen Farrell, Karen Milton, Circuit Executive of the Second Circuit in New York, had to guide her court and staff through the harrowing day of September 11th and its aftermath. Ralph DeLoach, Clerk of the U.S. District Court for the District of Kansas, confronted the nightmare of a murderer rampaging through the court and Frank Schwartz, Chief Probation Officer in the Southern District of Florida, and his staff struggled to cope with the enormous damage caused by Hurricane Andrew. We'll hear more about their experiences as we discuss some broader issues regarding leadership in times of crisis. We're also fortunate to have Bill Lehman, Deputy Assistant Director of the Office of Facilities and Security at the Administrative Office of the Courts with us. He has some important information for court managers preparing for or coping with emergency situations. As Marilyn mentioned earlier, we welcome your questions and comments either by fax or push the talk. We'll be asking some of you at push the talk sites to speak to some of these issues, but we want everyone in our viewing audience to feel free to participate. At the end of the panel discussion, we'll leave some specific time for responses from push the talk locations. But if you want to jump in earlier, please feel free to do so, and we'll get right to you as fast as we can. Now, I want to ask all of you a question. Several years ago, Judge Marvin Frankel said that there was nothing in the training of federal judges to prepare them adequately for the awesome responsibilities of sentencing criminals. To what extent could the same be said with equal conviction about court managers that nothing in their training prepares them for the awesome responsibility of leading in a crisis. And if this is true, how do you respond? What resources do you draw on? Karen? Well, Michael, it's true. It's not as if you take a course that teaches you how to operate in a major crisis. But most court managers have a, um, a lot of experience in a variety of areas, and it's that 
background that they can draw on in times of crisis. But it's really important to have managers in place who know how to keep their heads when others around them are losing theirs. On September 11th, I was here in Washington in this very building. And I can tell you that information coming out at the time was very sparse. It was often contradictory. There was a lot of anxiety and I would say borderline panic going on. But it was important to have someone who could say, wait a minute, let's take a deep breath, analyze the situation, and then make decisions and move on. First, it's important to make sure you, the staff and the judges are safe. Once you know your people are safe, then the next step is, okay, how do I get the court operational? Thanks, Karen. Appreciate your insights. Ralph, you had a pretty bad situation in Kansas at one point. Well, Michael, most people in a crisis situation are very unprepared because that's because it happens so infrequently. There's nothing that I know of in the education of court managers that uh, trains you or prepares you for a crisis. Certainly, I was not prepared for the crisis that occurred in Topeka, Kansas, when a despondent criminal defendant drove his car into the parking lot, blew his car up, made his way to the court security officer location, shot and killed the court security officer, threw a pipe bomb in the atrium hallway, then forced himself into the clerk's office where he held the clerk's office hostage for approximately seven hours. What you do immediately following that kind of an incident is pretty much instinctive. And really the first thing I think that you're concerned about are the employees and the people, their welfare, are they okay? There may be crisis management manuals on the shelf somewhere in various courts, but I have a feeling that they probably haven't been distributed and few court employees really are aware that they even exist. That's true. Thank you. Frank, uh, hard to prepare for a hurricane, isn't it? Well, I agree, and there are some things you can do, but I, I agree with what Ralph said and, and also Sherry Carter that, unfortunately, if you don't plan for looking at these things periodically, that you find that very quickly they become outdated. We found with, uh, we have a large staff, 260 plus employees, and that they're spread out over uh, 10 different offices, that if you're not careful, you really quickly learn that a lot of the phone numbers have changed, that people have moved. And if you don't have a process in place where you look at this or you have a way for them to get the information to a certain individual, that it becomes outdated and you really don't have it when you need it in an emergency. Absolutely, good point. Bill, I know the AO has some resources that are available to the courts in this area. Would you uh, comment on those, please? Sure, Michael. Thank you. It was actually the uh, experience that Frank just mentioned, Hurricane Andrew in 1992, where the administrative office first realized its responsibility in these kinds of crises. We formed at that time a disaster response team. I was appointed as a coordinator of that team, and we addressed the various issues that came up during that particular crisis. Uh, just as we have uh, since that crisis in a number of other hurricanes, uh, floods in Iowa, uh, the bombing in Oklahoma City, and of course earthquakes on the West Coast. Uh, the crisis response team is comprised of about 15 different program area offices here at the administrative office. Uh, we meet on a daily basis during the crisis to make sure any issues that come up in the court, whether it's pay of personnel or uh, facilities that are uh, in inhabitable, uh, or those kinds of things are taken care of. Each team member uh, continues to work in his or her program area to provide the kind of assistance that uh, is expected. Um, after September 11th, it became very clear that perhaps the, uh, the work of this disaster response team wasn't um, uh, enough. Uh, it, it, it became apparent that we needed to have more in-depth planning throughout the courts to help them uh, continue to operate. We are in the process of putting, putting together a contractor support team to develop a continuity of operation plan for the courts in New York City. We'll take advantage of their learned experiences and be able to de develop then some model plans that could be used by the rest of the courts in developing their own continuity of operations plan. We intend to have the contractor come in, help us develop a model plan, and then have some representatives from uh, the courts uh, further develop the model plan to ensure its uh, utility. Sounds like that'll be a very helpful resource. You mentioned, Bill, that when you become aware of a disaster, you react quickly. And my question to you is, how do you become aware of a disaster? We become aware through a variety of different sources. Primarily, it's the court who calls and explains that an uh, earthquake has happened or a bomb has gone off or uh, the hurricane is, is about to hit. 
uh, occasionally we'll, we'll hear through the media, obviously, uh, and occasionally we'll be aware of something going on and actually call the court to, to make sure it happens. One of the initial things we do in addition to meeting as a team right off the, the, uh, the bat is to send a letter to the uh, chief judge of the court uh, describing the services of the AO, the disaster response team, uh, and granting certain elevated procurement authorities to the chief judge to aid in the recovery of computers or uh, purchase communication equipment or those kinds of things that uh, may be restricted by a lower procurement authority. Very good. Ralph, you had some experiences in Oklahoma City too, I think. Michael, I was one of the court unit executives that was asked to go uh, to Oklahoma City and help in the aftermath of the Oklahoma City bombing. The problem is everybody wants to help. The local court wants to help, the surrounding courts want to help, the circuit wants to help, the administrative office wants to help, and there really needs to be a lot of coordination of those eff efforts. It's true. Karen? Well, we had some of the same issues in the early days after September 11th, and sometimes it was difficult to determine who was in charge. You know, you had local agencies, state agencies, federal agencies, courts, local courts, and sometimes it seemed as if we didn't even all have the same mission, and we certainly had different areas of responsibility. But what we've learned from that experience is that you do need to have someone who can coordinate all of these efforts, as Ralph said. And usually that person is going to be the circuit executive, the clerk of court, some senior court manager who has to be the liaison between the chief judge and the other agencies and keep the information flowing. And one of the things we've learned since then is we've dusted off our occupant emergency plan and we've updated it for both the Court of Appeals building and the district court building. Um, we've actually put together a real emergency protocol um, that gets that's posted with the marshals and the CSOs so they know who to call um, and they have a list of people they can go down if someone's not in the office. Um, and we're also working with the administrative office and Bill Lehman's staff in putting together a real continuity of operation plan. So we're learning from what happened on September 11th. Thanks. Bill, I could tell that that's music to your ears, what Karen just said about working on these plans, and you're helping the courts uh, overall, is that right? That's exactly right, and, and uh, our contractor hopefully will be able to uh, develop the plans for the courts in New York and develop in the, the model plans uh, with us. Okay. Bill, what's the difference between the uh, disaster plans and the continuity of operation plans? That's a very good question, uh, Michael. Uh, the office, uh, occupant emergency plan that Karen has mentioned a couple of times and you heard uh, uh, Sherry and, and Ellen Lesline speak of it, the OEP is a plan that's designed to evacuate individuals from the building uh, when there's an emergency in the building. It provides for uh, a central uh, uh, convening area and uh, perhaps uh, a designation of who's in charge. Uh, just as you heard uh, Kathleen Farrell indicate that the chief judge the bankruptcy court was a designated official uh, for their OEP. That's contrasted to the continuity of operation plan. It's a longer term plan. Uh, it's expected that you cannot get back into the facility. You'll need to have an alternate facility and then provide for all of those kinds of things that you would have to do in a 30 to 45 day per period at that alternate facility. Uh, the memorandum that we, uh, the direct director sent out on October 17th of 2001, entitled Emergency Preparedness in the Judiciary, describes both of these plans in some detail. It provides checklists and it provides outlines uh, to develop these plans. The OEP is primarily a, a GSA uh, document, however, it must be fully coordinated with all of the tenants in the building and generally the uh, judiciary officials are the senior officials who uh, must take responsibility for that plan. Uh, the continuity of operation plan uh, is a slightly different document focused on the operations, of course, uh, and would be oriented toward the judiciary activities. Uh, there's no question that that memorandum, the October 17th memorandum, if you don't have a copy of that, it's important to have a copy of that in your uh, uh, files. Thanks very much, Bill. It's very helpful. I want to turn now toward some of the broader uh, leadership issues that Marilyn said that we would be covering. In a November 2001 Fortune magazine story on leadership during times of crisis, reporter Jerry Usim uh, detailed the characteristics of effective leaders in these times. One of the specific areas that he identified as being helpful to leaders is the characteristic of visibility. People need to be visible, leaders need to be visible during these times, and he pointed to the actions of Mayor Giuliani as an example, as an illustration of the importance of visibility. Giuliani was everywhere. 
in the wake of the September 11th attacks. He was with the firefighters. He was on television. He was seen running from the buildings and so forth. Let's take a look at what Sherry Carter has to say about the importance of visibility, and then we'll come back to our panelists. I would say the first week or two, I did a lot of walking around. And I went to each department. I talked to almost every employee, made sure they understood what happened. I sent out a lot of memorandums. I'm a visible person anyway. I do a lot of walking around anyway. So that's not unusual for me. But whenever there's any kind of a crisis, I walk around, make sure employees have an opportunity to ask me questions, make sure they know that everything's OK. I really think that leaders set the tone. And if they think I'm panicked, then it's going to be a different office. But if they see I'm calm and everything's under control, I think they feel a little bit safer. Ralph, visibility? Michael, one of the lessons I learned as a result of the uh, Topeka crisis was that it's extremely important to be visible. It's extremely important for you to show your concern for the employees, put the people first. Uh, when, the bomb, when the shooting occurred in uh, Topeka, I was in Wichita, and I was able to immediately travel from Wichita to Topeka. And I feel fortunate that I was able to meet and spend a few minutes with each employee as they were released uh, from the hostage situation. That was really instinctive, as I mentioned uh, previously. And I really didn't find out till later how much that meant to the employees that I was there and able to show my concern. Absolutely. And it reminds me of an article I recently read in the Harvard Business Review on compassionate leadership, where uh, an, an example was given of a CEO of a corporation who lost several people in the World Trade Center. And then he flew the families of the victims to the company headquarters in Framingham, Massachusetts, and was there at midnight as they got off the plane to greet them. And as you say, that meant such a great deal to them. It's very important. Frank, sometimes it's hard to be visible, though. Well, right. Uh, in the example of uh, the hurricane, the visibility issue was a little more complicated for us. It took uh, us several days, the chief and myself, to be able to get out of our neighborhoods and even get down to the office. So we had to rely on some of the people in our northern division uh, to come down from West Palm Beach and Fort Lauderdale to staff the office. And later on, they were down there to help with a lot of other things that we had to do. But I think you sometimes have to look that if you're not able to be there immediately, that you have other people that are able to step in and help out during these kinds of crises. Good point, like surrogate visibility, That's in a right. sense. Mm -hmm. Karen? You well, I agree with what Ralph and Frank have said. But visibility, to some extent, is also defined by the crisis at hand. As I said, I was in Washington on September 11th. When I arrived home the following day, our employees had already been evacuated from the building, and they were scattered to their homes across the New York metropolitan area. So it wasn't a sense that someone could be out there physically, but we had a phone tree going. And with the phones being erratic, it wasn't that you could reach everyone, but I usually uh, was able to reach the resident judges. The chief um, judge took care of the non-resident judges in keeping them informed. I could always reach at least one senior staff person, even though it wasn't always the same senior staff person. And we tried at least every other day to make sure that everybody was calling someone to try to keep people updated on what was happening. We managed to reach TV and radio stations and at least could put out some sort of a banner that said the federal courts were closed, so that employees knew not to come to court, that the bar and the public knew that the courts were temporarily closed. On the day we brought staff back, however, I stood on the steps of the courthouse and tried to greet as many employees who returned that day as possible. We also had members of EAP, the Employee Assistance Program available. We had members of the um, Southern District, New York uh, Probation Crisis, um, their Crisis Incident Management uh, teams who were there to talk to people and to try to help them uh, get through any issues they had with respect to what happened. We had the chief judge there who spoke to everyone. Um, and like Sherry, in the weeks after September 11th, we all, all of the senior managers, including myself, tried to be more visible. We tried to talk to employees to see if people were still having problems. We did a lot of memos. Um, so it, depending on your crisis, you know, visibility will, will change in that way. Thank you. Very, very in interesting comment. Um, I'm going to just uh, suggest that at this point we see if anybody in the Push the Talk sites would like to ask a question. Uh, I know there are some uh, anxious questioners in the Thurgood Marshall building. I know the appellate clerks are here and may have a question, or maybe Frank Dosal out in Minnesota has a question. Would anybody like to ask a question at this point? 
Uh, this is Tom Kahn from the 11th Circuit. I guess this question is addressed to Karen. Uh, what did you do with your employees for the time off when they couldn't work until they could get back into the buildings with regard to charging leave or administrative leave or paying them for their hours, which is a concern to people that have to make mortgage payments and have other responsibilities? Well, um, at the time, Tom, we decided to be very flexible in terms of how we handle the issue of leave. Um, because the courts were closed, and even though our court, the Court of Appeals, resumed hearing oral arguments on the following Monday, September 17th, at an alternate location in Midtown, the City Bar Association, we didn't have all of the staff back. So we decided that from September 11th through September 24th, the day that all of the staff was, was instructed to report for work, that we would for, we would restore everyone's leave. We didn't charge anyone leave, even if they had put in for annual leave. And one of our theories was that you know even if you were on vacation, your vacation really evaporated on September 11th because from what we heard anecdotally, people were just trying to get back home. So we basically restored everybody's leave balances to pre-September 11th status, whatever it was on September 10th. And for employees who came in. Um, in those two weeks from September 11th to December 24th, even if you weren't officially entitled to comp time, we asked senior managers to let personnel know who would come in and for how many hours, and we gave comp time out with the exception of senior managers and court unit executives. And I think that did a lot for morale and for um, making people feel less anxious about those issues with respect to paychecks and things like that. Thank you. Any other questions or we'll go on? Okay, we're going to go on, and we'll give you another opportunity to ask questions in a little while. I want to come now to the idea of connectedness. Uh, we talked, Frank mentioned, about how sometimes you need to rely on surrogate visibility. And this leads to another question, which is what approaches did you take to communicate with your staff and others during a crisis? Let's first hear a brief comment from Sherry Carter, and then we'll hear from our panelists. We usually distribute our memorandums by email. And we, we hand carried them around, which I think set the importance of the, of the memos also to staff because we, we never do that. Karen, communicating. Communicating was a big issue for us on September 12th. Uh, when the towers fell, unlike the Southern District Bankruptcy Court, we lost our telecommunication ability and we lost our data communication ability. Other than the judges, we, you know, staff didn't have cell phones. So one of the things we did, um, was to figure out how do we communicate and we were able with the help of the administrative office we purchased 75 cell phones and the and we relied on those cell phones for months after <coughs> September 11th and they were distributed not only to all of the judges um, and to but we had one per chambers all of the senior staff and other departments within the major offices so that if you were a member of the bar you, there was a cell phone number you could now call to reach the calendar team or a cell phone you could call to reach the library um, one of the other things we had to figure out was how to get the circuit up and running because the Court of Appeals was the hub for the circuit. So when we went down, the circuit went down. So um, we managed to move the circuit operations over to Brooklyn, to the Eastern District, and we were able to get the circuit's email and internet connectivity restored within a matter of days following September 11th. Um, that Friday after September 11th, I met with key circuit executive staff in a restaurant in Midtown, and we had our, quote, operations meeting, unquote, and basically decided who was going to take charge of what area um, to get things up and running. As I said before, we had a calling tree that we tried to um, keep going, and, we, and we've asked senior staff to continually call their people to just keep them in the loop and figure out what they needed to do to get their operations back and running, and then we tried to make it happen. Sounds like a complicated uh, set of facts, but you handled it, I think, as well as you could. Thank you for that comment. Uh, one of the first things, as Ralph mentioned earlier, one of the first things that leaders have to do is to account for their people. In fact, in a nationally televised leadership conference shortly after September 11th, Michael Dell uh, said that one of the first thoughts he had uh, after the attacks was where are his people and where are his customers? And he worked hard to bring his customers back online just as was mentioned the AO has been working hard to bring the courts uh, back online in, in these situations. Uh, what do you do to account for your people, Frank? Well, Michael, after the hurricane, we had uh, over a million people without electricity, 
As I mentioned earlier, it was hard to drive on the roads. We had no phone service. Uh, actually, there were 63,000 people in the southern part of our county that lost their homes, and there were about 175,000 people that became homeless. So it was difficult for us to start accounting for some of the people in that area because we just couldn't pick up the phone and call. There weren't a lot of cell phones back in 1992, and, and even then they may not have worked very well. So we had to, once again, improvise. We, uh, some of the people that we had heard from, we asked if they had heard from other individuals. We had some people that went out and started looking for some people they hadn't heard from that lived in the general area so they could get to quickly. And eventually we were able to account for everybody, but it was because we almost went out literally in some places door to door to look for people. And so sometimes you just have to do what you can do under the circumstances to account for some of the people that are missing. And it sounds like there was a great willingness of people to help out in that situation. Absolutely. Yeah. Karen? Do you well, I think, like Frank, one thing you find in a crisis is, is the wonderful resiliency of court employees, and everybody wants to help and be part of it. Before September 11th, we had regularly handed out um, lists of phone numbers and addresses for employees, and we handed them out to senior staff and to judges and said, take this information home, keep it if you need it. What we found out was that not everyone did that, but at least somebody had it. So even if a manager didn't have this information, we were able to hand out this information, and so the manager could then reach out, or we had someone else reach out for those people. Since September 11th, one of the things we've done is we've put together wallet-sized cards for the, the judges and the staff. And like Kathleen, the judge's card has the 800 number for the U.S. Marshals. It has the local Marshals number on it. It also has my home phone number and cell phone number. It has our clerk of court, Roseanne McKechnie's home phone number and cell phone number. And it also tells you which t TV stations to tune into or which radio stations. And the staff have, with the exception of Roseanne and my home phone numbers, they have the other information so they know in a crisis, you know, where to call in. Um, unfortunately for us, even if we'd had the website or we'd had our um, emergency number, we didn't have any phones, so there wasn't a place for employees to call in. But I guess we did something right because the staff knew basically not to come back till Monday, September 24th, and all of the lawyers who had to appear for arguments beginning September 17th seemed to know where they had to go. So. Like Frank said, you improvise, and by hook or by crook, you get everybody to where they have to be. So you've given the judges your home phone number, it sounds like. <laughs> it's too late to go back. <laughs> yeah, okay. Ralph, uh, accounting for people. Uh, Michael, communication connectivity, that's a very important issue, and I think is one that um, I learned a lesson from in the aftermath of the Oklahoma City bombing. I really do believe that these disaster plans we're talking about developing should incorporate the provision for a command center a center that's capable of receiving and disseminating uh, information. It will eliminate mixed messages and mixed understandings to a great degree, I believe. And Bill, I think you like that idea, don't you? Uh, yes, Michael, thanks. <laughs> um, there's no question that uh, from all the participants we've uh, heard, uh, both the, uh, the flood in uh, Los Angeles and around the table, having a person who's in charge and having a location uh, to go to or to get information to is vitally important and of course the guidance that we have indicated in our OEP and, and COOP guidance provides for both a succession of authorities to be identified and then the alternate command sites to, uh, to be identified. Great. Time now for another break and see if anybody in the Push the Talk uh, sites would like to come in with a question. Uh, I know we have sites up in Tampa, Richmond, Lexington, Kentucky, Aberdeen, Mississippi, and in Puerto Rico. Anybody uh, have a question for any of our panelists? Yeah, this is Fritz Fulbruggy, clerk at the Fifth Circuit down in New Orleans. And once you've gotten in touch with your employees through whatever communication methods you have, I'd be interested probably in listening to Karen and uh, uh, others discuss how do you actually make arrangements with the local authorities to get people into the courthouse or to an alternate work site location. I'm concerned that in, in the New Orleans area, the worst case scenario says downtown New Orleans is under 15 feet of water for six months. So how do you get people in to see what your real damage assessment is and your real needs are? Well, I guess um, that was my job. When I, got, when I arrived home on Wednesday, September 12th, and spoke with Chief Judge Walker, um, I, he gave me the pager number of one of the local marshals who had thought to call him. 
and using that pager number, I got in touch with the marshals, and although Lower Manhattan was sealed off, through the marshals, they basically drove me into the courthouse complex so that I could try to get some numbers for GSA and for other um, agencies and try to figure out what we were going to be able to do. Um, we were very lucky in the sense that the building was, was sealed off, but the building itself was structurally sound, and it was a question of you know, cleaning the building and kind of deciding when the New York City police and, and um, the Joint Terrorist Task Force were going to decide that they would move the barricades back north of, um, south of Canal Street and would enable people to come back. And that took us, that was basically one of the reasons that we didn't reopen till the 24th. They had opened, I think, um, within a week, they were basically saying that they were going to start allowing the public to come back down. Um, one of the things we're working on, because we really didn't have it, is to have an alternate site where we could put people. And that was something that Roseanne McKechnie and I discussed in terms of if we were not able to get back into the building, could we set up in Brooklyn? Could we set up in White Plains? One of the reasons the court held arguments in Midtown Manhattan, where Roseanne and her staff actually accepted filings uh, the week after September 11th, was because we felt it was a centralized location for both litigants and members of the bar. But um, one of the things I think that's important is to make sure the local marshals have the home phone numbers or cell phone numbers of the people who are going to be your emergency people in charge. The fact that the local marshals also had my home phone number, mm -hmm. you know, made it easier for us to, to try to get some connectivity mm -hmm. and be able to get information that I could then feed to the chief judge and to other senior managers. Um, and then you just improvise. Yeah. Frank, you gave a central number that people could call in. Uh, we have a, a piece of equipment that we use, um, and it allows for, it's, it's basically a message machine, but it allows for lots of messages. We use it with our victims program, where a lot of victims call in. So it can account for hundreds of messages, uh, people calling in and letting us know where they are, and we can also put messages on there to let people know what to do. So you can use it both ways, but it's a good communication tool so that people can keep the, you know, be kept abreast of what's going on. Great. Did we answer your question, Fritz? Sure did. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks for your question. Let's move on now. There, uh, in these uh, situations, as you're already hearing, there are millions of details to be on top of. And um, it might be tempting uh, in this situation, although I should say, though it might be tempting in this situation the, to do it all yourself, to play the Lone Ranger, it doesn't sound like a good strategy. Uh, let's hear from Sherry Carter on this subject. I guess the most important thing to me in handling an emergency at, of this size is just involving as many people as you can. I think we came up with some very creative ways to solve problems by doing it in a team approach. I didn't try to solve every problem by myself. I called in the other managers. We called in section employees. and explained to them what some of the problems were and had some really good solutions. Ralph, uh, what do you think? Michael, I think it's kind of important to look at the court unit executive as a conductor who's providing uh, some direction. You really can't do it all yourself and you've got very talented people on your staff and outside your staff, frankly, who are interested and willing to help and you need to try to rely on those people to help you get through all the problems that you're going to face. Absolutely. Karen? Well, it's true. As Ralph and Sherry have said, um, you can't do it all yourself, although sometimes you may feel as if you're all alone in the midst of the crisis. But you have to get your senior staff together. They have to get their supervisors together. Everybody has to take a piece of the pie and put it together. What you have to do is try to coordinate it and make sure that everyone's pulling together and working toward the same goal and making sure that you know, the information flows you know, to a central point um, and that you're the linchpin. And that's sort of how the chief judge and I tried to do it. You know, I tried to, we tried to keep each other in the loop, and then each of us had different responsibilities of who else needed to be in the loop. But the other thing is it's not just the court staff that's involved here. You have to keep the marshals, you know, in the loop, and they need to be apprised of what your needs are and what they're doing. Um, they can then be your liaison to other local agencies. You need to talk to GSA if you're in a GSA building or your landlord. So there's a lot of different pieces. But as Ralph said, you're kind of the fulcrum or the center from which all the information flows into, and then you can help, you know, sort of sift through it and make sure that everybody else is doing his or her part to get things back up and running. And you can do this in advance, right, Ralph? And Actually, I, I think, as one of the callers indicated, you know, how do you handle some of these situations? And really, during the crisis, 
is really not the time to be trying to figure out how you handle these situations. And that's why it's extremely important, even though it may never happen to you, that you develop a plan for how you are going to notify people, how you do get in touch with GSA to make a damage assessment, how you get a hold of the administrative office, the marshal service. Yeah, Karen, you have We've learned a tremendous amount since September 11th. Um, and, and that's really true. As I said, we've redrafted our emergency occupant plan both for the district court building at 500 Pearl Street and for the Court of Appeals building, uh, which we share with the district court at 40 Foley Square. Um, you know, we have new floor wardens. We, we're training people on how to evacuate the building. We're making sure all the signs are accurate. We're making sure everyone knows that L means lobby and that's where you exit in 40 Foley Square. Um, one of the complaints we had about September 11th was that it took too long to disseminate information and to make the decision to evacuate the building. We're hoping that having a vitalized or a revitalized emergency occupant plan and an emergency protocol will solve those problems. But it's also important, I think, that when things don't go right all the time, that you admit that to people. You say that we're going we're gonna, to, it didn't go right, but we're going to fix it. And that's what we did. I stood up on September 24th, and the first thing I said to the staff was, I'm really sorry about the complaints and that people thought it didn't go well. On the other hand, we all got out of the building, but here's how we're going to fix it. Here's how we're going to make it right. And I think we've kept our word. We've had more training sessions in the months following September 11th than we had in my first three years with the court. So hopefully people are feeling more positive mm -hmm. about what we're doing to show people that we're concerned about their safety and we want to protect our staff. Great. And we're, all, we're doing them here too, as you all learned personally yesterday being involved in, in a drill here at the uh, Judiciary Building. Um, I want to turn to a slightly different component of leadership. Uh, there are many people, uh, leaders, who say, I'm not a counselor, I don't feel comfortable as a counselor. When it comes to providing counseling to my staff, I really don't know what to do. Uh, I'm, I'm wondering what kind of advice uh, you would provide to these leaders, but before you respond, let's hear from Kathleen Farrell on the subject. The emotions of the staff, be prepared to deal with that. We, I called EPA, EAP immediately and they said, well, we're a little stretched right now because we have a lot of people who were a little bit more directly affected by this than your office. So it took them about a week or so and they did get us somebody. And what he did was he had everyone sort of uh, relate their experiences about September 11th and I for one was very shocked at how personally everybody was really touched by this um, and the experiences that we all had. And I think it did us all a lot of good to hear what each other had gone through it and gone through on that day. Frank, uh, counseling in these times? Well, Michael, I think that, again, in our situation, it was difficult to really get people to go to places or make phone calls because they didn't have phone service. But we, I think we found that early on, a lot of people really weren't interested in professional services. They wanted to have somebody come by. We got people out to some of the homes to help them with some uh, repairs around the house, putting uh, plastic over their roofs, actually bringing them bottled water. Some of the people couldn't get to a food store, uh, couldn't get some of the food stores in the South End were 50 or 60 miles away from where people needed to go. So it was just nice to have somebody there that they knew that they could count on someone to come by, someone they could talk to. Uh, it was also important for them to know that there were other people in the office that were okay. We were able to give them information about how other people were doing. And I think they appreciated that early on more than anything else. And then eventually, uh, when things got back a little bit more to normal, then the professional services were things that we looked to uh, provide for some of the individuals. Very good. It sounds like you had a lot of cooperation in your staff uh, in this time. We did. We had a lot of people coming down from West Palm Beach and Fort Lauderdale. They loaded up trucks of uh, plywood, plastic, uh, bottled water, and they spent just days driving down in caravans because what used to take a few hours to get to some of these people's homes were taking eight, nine hours to get to because of traffic, blocked roads, and because of checkpoints with the National Guard. Wow. Ralph, you've had a situation too in, in this regard. Yeah, Michael, I think one of the most interesting things I learned in the aftermath of Topeka and Oklahoma City was that people really weren't that interested in counseling in the traditional sense of the word immediately after, for example, the shooting incident in Topeka. And I think this goes a little bit to the caller from the 11th Circuit. What they're really interested in is, is who's going to pay for my time off? If, if I had some damage, who's going to take care of the damage? 
those kinds of practical issues in addition to what did happen and, and why did it happen. You try to bring in the resources from the Marshal Service or the FBI or whoever to try to, uh, to answer those kinds of questions. Then eventually, certainly, you need to get involved in counseling in the traditional sense. And I think you also have to be prepared that you're going to have some long-term counseling issues and you're going to have the possibility of some fallout with some people who just are not going to be capable of remaining in that environment and they're going to have to go to uh, some other location. That's true. Karen? We did many of the same things. Um, <clears throat> When we had the staff come back on September 24th, we thought it was important to have a couple of counselors from the emergency assistance program. We also had members of the Southern District New York, Western New York, and District of Maryland um, probation departments who were all um, trained uh, crisis, um, this critical, well, I always make this wrong, the SISM people, yes. the critical incident stress management team, and Dr. Mark Maggio from the Federal Judicial Center. Um, and they came up and spoke um, together to everyone in one room and then they ran separate counseling sessions and to our surprise you know we thought we'd be running these for two or three weeks and we basically ran them for the first week that people were back and after that um, it was more some one-on-one -on -one stuff we only had one employee though who ultimately decided following September 11th that she couldn't return to work so I think all in all you know we came through pretty well but we also sent out a lot of memos to try to keep people informed on what we were doing and as I said, I think the leave policy we adopted went a long way to helping people feel a lot better about what had happened. Sounds like, sounds like a good strategy. Bill, there are some other resources available, aren't there? There are, Michael. Uh, I'll refer back to the October 17th memo that I mentioned before. And by the way, that memorandum is, is on the uh, JNET at the court security homepage. Uh, it's on several different locations in the uh, JNET, but uh, that's a, an easy way to get to that memo in electronic format. That memo describes um, the, the ways you can make some initial contacts before a disaster ever happens. Uh, contacts with the local Red Cross, uh, contacts with the local FEMA office, uh, contacts with the local police and, and fire department to just establish the liaisons that many of us around the table have been talking about for uh, the past several minutes. To, to make sure that you have the phone numbers, to make sure that they know you exist. Uh, and within the federal community out there, there are a number of boards and other advisory councils that, that uh, periodically meet, uh, and they certainly come to uh, bear during crises. Uh, the Red Cross uh, is available certainly for all of these kinds of activities. One element that I haven't mentioned before but uh, exists within the judiciary is uh, the private associations that um, the you know, district court clerks, the bankruptcy court clerks, probation and pretrial officers have that uh, in many of these instances where as in the case of Hurricane Andrew individuals private homes their private possessions uh, their cars uh, everything that they have is gone uh, there's a way to develop a, a private relief organization among the judiciary family and we have in the past uh, I sent a memorandum from uh, signed by the director of the, of the administrative office Mr. Meekham uh, to the judiciary to announce these fundraising efforts. So that's just one other element that uh, shows how the judiciary family can pull together during these uh, mishaps and, and uh, help each other out uh, considerably. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Okay, time to go back and see if there are some questions out there. Michael, it's Russ in, uh, in Tampa, Florida, Russ Clams. Hi, Russ. Uh, here in the Middle District of Florida, all of our employees have access to uh, cell phones and to Palm Pilots. We store our um, emergency contact numbers on our Palm Pilots, and uh, they are updated every time we sync them to our computer, which should be every day. And uh, we're kind of proud of that technology. And um, those of us who are sitting here watching this program have decided that we're going to probably check into maybe putting uh, some further information on the Palm, such as uh, some t some abbreviated form of our emergency plan or con uh, emergency contact numbers, uh, and so that's really just a comment uh, to see uh, if you think that's a good use of that Palm technology, and if uh, anyone else has experience in that. It's, it, uh, uh, Russ, it's a small world because uh, uh, Frank Schwartz and I just were meeting with Jack Griggs today from your district, who showed us one of your Palm pilots and. We were duly impressed, and I think it's an excellent use of the technology, but I'm going to let the panelists speak, too. 
I can speak to that very briefly. Uh, in our discussions with uh, the national officials of FEMA and uh, the General Service Administration, that is exactly what they are doing. Uh, many of their employees, uh, certainly the key employees, do have Palm Pilots, and they have, in many cases, uh, their entire disaster plan uh, on, on that document, so it, it goes everywhere with them, quite frankly. Otherwise, uh, as Karen found out, certainly, if you don't have something at home that gives you all the phone numbers and all of the other kinds of things you need, uh, you're really lost. You need to get into the office. Uh, it replaces uh, the large three-ring notebook that many of these plans uh, fill up uh, that have to be carried around if you don't have something like that. Good point. Sounds like to me we all ought to be budgeting now for... Uh, <laughs> for <laughs> okay, we've just opened the floodgates. <laughs> okay. Uh, great idea, Russ. Thank you very much. Any other comments out there? Otherwise, I'll go to a fax question. Uh, let me ask you, this uh, question came in to us. In a situation as tragic and far-reaching as 9-11, when you must focus first on staff, staff safety and security, how and when do you take care of your own needs, such as ensuring that your family is safe and so forth? That's for the panelists. To well, I think, um, I think when the crisis is going on, you know, my feeling in the, in the first days was just focusing on, on basically what we had to do. I mean, when I was able, I guess, on the evening of September 11th, late that night, to get through to New Jersey and speak to the, my deputy circuit executive, John Coffey, my first question to John was, is everybody safe? Um, we had also learned since then that one of our judges hadn't shown up uh, for the panel that morning, and that judge lived in Battery Park City, and there was some question on where, where that judge was. So that was my next concern when I got to speak to the chief the next day, was to ha ask to start trying to call around to other judges to see if we could link up um, where this sort of missing judge, um, although the judge didn't know he was missing, where our missing judge was. Um, and we ultimately found him, but it took a few days and it was, it was a little stressful for that first 48 hours not knowing. Um, but I think, you know, as the, as I guess what you have to know is as the crisis passes, the answer is yes, you need, you need to take some time for you, whether it's, you know, turning off the cell phone when you have dinner or, you know, going for that, you know, working out, going for a walk, doing something. I mean, I think the first thing I was able to do was my anniversary, wedding anniversary was that Sunday. And um, even though I had been basically 24-7, it seemed, on the phone, um, I turned off my cell phone for the two hours, and we went out to dinner. And I have to say, uh, the scotch was really good that night. <laughs> <laughs> How many messages did you have? But, you and I had about 10 messages <laughs> when I got back, and I was on the phone till 11 o'clock Sunday night, but that was OK. okay. Um, you know, I needed that two-hour period to take a deep breath to be able to you know, hit the ground running the next day. And, and all of us around this table no, you know, have to know that. And, and sometimes you don't always know that. Absolutely. OK, thanks. Anybody else want to comment on that? Otherwise, we'll move on. Um, the next question I have for the panelists is, uh, what was your biggest surprise in managing in a crisis? Frank? Well, Michael, I think the biggest surprise was that after we did all the planning that we did, and after we thought we had everything in order, that along comes something that you just weren't prepared for, like anthrax. And all of a sudden, all the planning we had done really didn't help us prepare or plan for this type of a crisis. So I think what I'm basically trying to say is that as much as you plan, you can't plan for everything. So I think that you just sort of have to have in place the kinds of processes that allow you to deal with the unexpected. Have good lines of communication established with the U.S. Marshal, local law enforcement, the AO, whatever it takes, uh, then I think you're going to be at least in a better position to communicate the things that you need to do to get the word out, to get things resolved more quickly, but you just never can be prepared for everything. Thanks. Ralph? Michael, we were uh, very gratified, not surprised really, by the response from the AO. But we weren't just surprised by the response from GSA, we frankly were astonished. Because GSA came in and within a week's period of time, not only put down new carpet, put up new wall covering, but completely reconfigured our office because the people who were experienced in counseling thought that was very important so that people didn't feel like, at least to an extent, they were in the same environment they were when the, when the incident occurred. Thank you. Did you want to comment on that? Or? Well, the one thing I would just say, Michael, is, is that um, I, was, I was surprised to learn that although we often refer 
to ourselves as part of the federal judiciary family, we really are family. And I was astounded, um, not just at much how our staff pulled together, but how much people wanted to help from other courts, not only within the Second Circuit, but from across the country. And especially people, key people here at the administrative office, Pete Lee, Mel Bryson, Ross Eisenman, John Heeman and their staffs, um, were tremendously supportive and, and helpful to us in navigating the shoals of September 11th. Thank you. Sounds like a microcosm of what happened in the nation with the community-based uh, efforts. Absolutely. And so forth. We have a fax question from Puerto Rico from Dana Rodriguez. Hi, Dana. Uh, about uh, the question of uh, remote locations and storing information and confidentiality of that information. Any any suggestions on that issue? Well, we have uh, a lot of remote locations. We actually have uh, ten field offices, uh, and we have one more that's coming in. Actually, only two of our offices are in courthouses. The rest are in lease space. So we um, have that situation. Uh, we've tried to look for buildings where there's a little more security, uh, not storefront types of uh, office locations where you have to go in. Uh, we, we had uh, some problems with storefront locations, so we've tried to avoid that, and we're avoiding that in the future. Uh, I do think you need to have, w which was mentioned earlier on in the broadcast, some redundancy. You do have to have uh, your computers, servers, and be able to be up and running from other locations uh, because if one location is down, you, you have to be able to be able to move along. And if you have some other offices that you can do that with, I think that's also critically important. Terrific. Um, let me move on and let's hear uh, at this point from uh, Sherry, again, Sherry Carter and Kathleen Farrell both uh, commented on things that surprised them in in managing to a cri uh, leading in a crisis? The positive side of the flood is I was surprised at how all of the employees worked together and pulled together to clean this up. I really did not expect over 60 employees to volunteer to work weekends. And we're talking not just two-day weekends, but three-day weekends where they would come in every day to, to work together. It was really a positive experience because we had courtroom deputies working with DACA clerks, working with records clerks, working with procurement clerks, really on a team project and it was, a, it was really a wonderful experience to see them work together. The Monday after the attack, I got a call from one of the uh, employees in the records room whose job it was to make sure that the mail was picked up. And he called me and he said, but the mail, nobody's picked up the mail in three days. It's going to be really backed up. Do you mind if I come in? And I said, no, John, by all means, come on in. So John came in, and he got on the phone and tracked down the mail, because the post office across the street was closed. It was totally out of commission. Tracked down the mail to 34th Street, 34th Street schlepped up to 34th Street under not the, most, the best conditions, because the trains were not running that well. Um, and picked up the mail and schlepped it back on the train and brought it and sorted it. And so we, that Monday we had our mail. On West Wing last night, there was a, someone made a quote and I jotted this down and, it said, and they said, in a crisis, people need to, need to feel like soldiers, not victims. And that certainly was proven to me on September 11th from my staff. We had people that just filled roles, took care of one another. Uh, one employee thought to pull out all the coffee filters and hand, hand out those to use for face masks. I mean, just really creative, good things that went on. We've instructed our panel on the meaning of the word schlep, in case you're wondering. Uh, I do have a very poignant question from our friend and colleague in San Antonio, John Bird, the Chief of Pretrial Services. And let me read John's question and uh, ask the panel to, uh, to reply. And the question is, what suggestion does the panel have for coordination between court agencies, as well as the necessary coordination between the district and circuit, particularly with emphasis to who is ultimately in charge when a crisis occurs? That's a, That's a good question. And again, Michael, I think that's something that um, through negotiation and conversation ought to be worked out in advance so that people have a full understanding well in advance of a crisis of who is going to take charge of what. And it's probably not going to be just one person or one entity that's going to be in charge. And that goes back a little bit again to sort of the command center structure that ought to coordinate all the activities of GSA, the marshals, the courts, the circuit. You have sort of one location where you can uh, disseminate information and where information can be received. Great. Bill? 
I'd like to go back one more time to the October 17th memorandum because that really is a good document. Uh, it, it speaks to this issue somewhat. We recommend that uh, each court uh, appoint a disaster preparedness coordinator, normally a court unit executive. And we would anticipate that would be a single individual for the district court and for the bankruptcy court perhaps and certainly at the circuit level. Uh, we also indicate in there that it's important to develop the coordination that uh, Ralph has just talked about and is implicit in the question certainly that uh, somebody needs to be responsible for developing the plans and then making sure they're practiced and executed appropriately when, when they have to be executed. So the October 17th memorandum kind of speaks to these issues. Okay, thank you. Any, anybody else want to come in on that one? Okay, thanks for the question, John. Uh, let, me, uh, let me ask again if there are any more questions from our Push to Talk sites as we uh, move toward wrapping up here. Uh, we have uh, some sites we haven't heard from yet. Uh, anybody have a question for our panel? Just to uh, react to the last set of questions and comments and uh, reading accounts of what happened in New York and how uh, Giuliani became in the eyes of the firefighters General Giuliani and he was uh, so much, he put himself so much in charge that he was even having to keep people who were trying to help in line, so to speak, so the first responders could really be there first and some of the celebrities who wanted to get in were kept at bay and so forth. So uh, I think this really is a serious issue and uh, one that, as you say, requires uh, thinking in advance. Uh, well, uh, assuming there are no, uh, uh, are no further uh, comments from our uh, uh, Push the Talk sites, Last chance. Speak now or forever hold your peace. It sounds like, uh, like people have no more questions, in which case we'll uh, move toward our wrap-up. I do want to thank our panelists, both live and on tape, for their important contributions to this program. They've given us a lot of food for thought. And also thanks to you viewers who participated. And now I'll turn the program back to Marilyn for some final thoughts about leading in times of crisis. Thanks, Michael. As we've discussed today, in emergencies, the managerial rule books simply fail to prepare us adequately. Given this reality and the knowledge that crises are likely to arise in our work lives, we've explored today what it takes to leave effectively in such times. Our panel members have highlighted a number of effective actions they took. Here's a summary of the important points they discussed, along with some additional recommended leadership strategies. First, be present and visible to employees. Particularly in times of uncertainty, people want to know that their leaders are physically present and emotionally available to them, and that they are doing everything possible to ensure their employees' safety. Where physical presence isn't possible, as Frank Schwartz noted, leaders should find other ways of being visible. Keep communication channels open. Communication is a lifeline for employees and can help minimize misinformation. Our panelists emphasize the importance of having a strong notification system and using every communication option available to keep employees informed. Remain calm. Leaders who can't master their own fears can infect a whole group, says Daniel Goleman, author of a new book, Primal Leadership. Anxiety prevents the mind from absorbing new information and solving problems. As Sherry Carter stressed, the leader who remains calm can ease employees' fears and anxiety. Act with emotional intelligence. Leadership literature describes the capacity to manage our, our emotions and our interactions with others as emotional intelligence. Especially in times of crises, leaders must use their emotional intelligence. They must be in control of their emotions, but also in touch with their feelings. This is essential in order to foster a compassionate environment. The authors of a January Harvard Business Review article in Leading in Times of Trauma emphasize that there are two levels to this. One is creating a context for meaning. By sharing their own feelings with staff and establishing an environment in which people can express their emotions, leaders can help employees make sense of their pain and comfort each other. 
In this safe environment, people can more easily get back to work because they don't have to expend energy trying to ignore or suppress their feelings. On the second level, leaders establish a context for action by creating an atmosphere in which employees can act to ease their pain. Leaders can use their visibility and status to inspire action, such as locating or juggling resources or coordinating groups that are not usually connected. Reaching out, as Karen Milton described, even from long distance to offer support and assistance. Reaffirm organizational values. Crisis shines a bright light on organizational values, notes authors of Overdrive, managing in crisis-filled times. And employees remember how they were treated during a highly emotional time. Leaders who ensure the security of employees first and enlist the strengths and skills of all staff to restore operations send strong signals about the organization's values. Build upon experience. Just as the Chinese symbol for crisis combines the symbols for danger and opportunity, as we've heard, leaders can use crisis as an opportunity to make positive changes, from updating phone trees to creating disaster recovery plans to helping staff connect their everyday work to a larger purpose. For more information about preparing for and leading in times of crisis, there's a list of resources in your handout. The four videotapes listed are available for circulation through the Center's media library. In closing, I want to once again thank our panelists who, and all our viewers who participated in today's broadcast. We appreciate your feedback and ask that you please remember to fill out your evaluation forms and return them to your coordinator. We also hope you and many of your staff will join us on April 18th for our second program on this important topic. Thank you.